Welcome to the February 2021 DevOps for Defense uh, meetup. This week, this month, we're doing something different. We're going to uh, try a more cinematic approach. So we're just going to record some content for a presentation and publish that for our community. Uh, as we go forward, we're going to experiment to try to focus more on the uh, on the networking and interaction uh, in our live sessions and and try to bring some topics to the community um, in via YouTube and, and our blog posts. So stay tuned for that. Uh, please provide feedback. If you like it, we'll stick with it and, uh, and, and go from there. If you uh, prefer the, the traditional format that we've been doing, uh, please let us know and we'll, we'll adjust back. But that's what we're doing. This month's topic is DevOps for documentation. And, and this is a bit of a topic that we touched on, uh, in August of 2019. So, uh, over a year ago, and I went back and was was looking at uh, you know how well did that hold up, and and I felt like uh, the concepts and ideas were still totally relevant to our work, but I also realized that the demonstrations were overly complicated. The examples uh, in the in the repos that we published weren't exactly repeatable, uh, so I wanted to do a refresh on this topic. And, and bring that to, uh, to the community. So what do I mean by, by DevOps for defense? Well, I have this premise that, that government contracting is in a state of transition. We see our contracts doing things like uh, requiring us to be agile. Uh, we also see uh, things like the DevSecOps reference design being put on contract, either as a requirement or a reference document. And so we can see the government uh, moving forward uh, and adopting these principles from the commercial world. And one thing I hear people say quite often is as we work through this, we need to focus more on working software over comprehensive documentation. And we've been very document heavy historically. Uh, but I still think this is a challenge for us. And our, one of the key challenges is uh, with any agile transition uh, for that matter is applying the new processes, the new techniques, the new behaviors, but maintaining the old, you end up uh, sort of shooting yourself in the foot. You don't, uh, you don't see the speed. You don't see the affordability improvements because you're still doing all the old stuff. But on top of that, you're doing these new agile like things. And, and that's driven by uh, a number of factors that we'll talk about. But uh, this premise is built on this idea that, number one, our contracts usually have more document deliverables than software deliverables. Um, and then our contracts are run often by acquisition uh, program offices. And when you think about them, they don't actually use our software. They heavily use our documentation. And, and that's an interesting sort of conundrum for us to think through as a community. Uh, if the valuable thing is the documentation, then we should really think about how we improve the quality speed um, uh, of the delivery process for that documentation. And that's sort of foundation foundational to what we'll see uh, as we go through this. And then we have to recognize that uh, you know, when we're in a government context, the, the documentation has real value and it's in the best interest of the government to have good quality documentation. They need to worry about things like avoiding vendor lock-in um, and clearly defining system boundaries, uh, contractual responsibilities, uh, et cetera. And so, so I, I, what I wanna do is, is set the stage that, that while working software is clearly the most important thing for the end user and, and for success of the mission, we also need to recognize that, that comprehensive documentation and the quality and speed and, and affordability with which we can deliver that documentation is highly valuable as well. So, so here we are, we're, we have historically lived in, you know, mountains of documents. Um, and frankly, we don't really help ourselves much in this. I sort of crafted this to, to point out some of the challenges I see and have seen over my career in multiple programs. Uh, let's say that someone wants to do a process improvement. Uh, 
the the weight of not only uh, communicating that that idea or that improvement um, compounded with the challenge of the change process is daunting and and I think it's it's a disincentive for people in our industry to really innovate um, and, and drive the improvements that we're all looking for and want to facilitate and encourage. So we, we get this uh, this bit of a conundrum. We, we tell our teams that we're really excited and, and, and interested in their creativity and their innovation. But oftentimes that documentation, uh, whether it's design material, whether it's um, the documentation of the recommended change itself, or whether it's the processes that support it, are all very heavy and challenging for people to work their way through. You often have to know how to work the system to have any hope of getting through that process. So as we're thinking about how we transform within our industry, you know, we need to be really reconsidering these processes and how we, instead of, you know, in, enforce heavyweight approaches to managing change, how do we encourage very fast, very uh, outcome oriented experimentation and learning? Uh, we learned, you know, we heard, uh, I guess it was two DevSec or DevOps Enterprise summits ago uh, about the criticality of continuous learning. And I think it's particularly important uh, in this area with so much of our programs um, having requirements for substantial documentation and delivery of that documentation. Culture is a big part of this as well. Um, this documentation is often used as a methodology to drive bureaucratic culture. And, and that is pretty common in the defense industry. Um, how many times have we been through the rock drill of uh, bring me the next version of the document, bring me the next version of the document uh, in our approval processes? We, we have to recognize that, uh, that these processes are often driven by um, sometimes what's described as rigor, but what is often implemented as, as bureaucracy. Uh, that bureaucracy often leads to long wait times and waste um, and, and creates obstacles for us. So thinking of new ways to tackle documentation, I think is, is important. It's not only within, say, our processes, uh, but it's also within our deliverables. Um, a, a story that I'll share uh, from, from my experience, uh, we had an interface control document that, that needed to be updated. We had uh, some very specific scope associated with a change uh, in that. And it turns out it was a small change. It, it affected uh, a paragraph in one section of a 100-plus you know, page document. So the team got their hands on that. They, uh, they went through that change. They, uh, they submitted the change out for review and approval and they got 500 crit one comments back, literally. It took months to work through all of those comments and get them adjudicated and addressed. But what's striking to me is there was not one comment on the actual change to that interface document um, that was driven by the scope of the contract. So when we think about things like uh, schedule and, and cost, um, the way we manage these document deliverables can have huge impacts on our ability to deliver capability if we don't understand and streamline that uh, focused on small incremental change in the right kind of way. So we have to ask ourselves, can DevOps practices work for documents? And, and my assertion is that they can. I've highlighted a handful of things here that I think are important, but I, I wanna just talk to a couple of them. Uh, number one, um, if you remember the, the last video that we published um, deep diving into a subject, it was all about configuration management and, and version controls, critical element of that. So how do you version control your documents? In, in my experience, we are uh, heavily invested in the Microsoft Office uh, infrastructure. Um, there are some okay technologies associated with that, but in general, I would argue Microsoft Office, whether it's Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, what have you, are not inherently configuration manageable. And I see that as a major obstacle 
So I think we have to look outside at different solutions that allow us to institute that uh, number one leading indicator of high performing teams in our documentation. Now this is, is pretty scary as we have a lot of people in our programs and in our teams who, um, whose career is built around their, their knowledge and skills of, of utilizing Microsoft Office products. So this uh, is an is a obstacle, um, that learning curve uh, and ability to get comfortable with uh, sort of a new thought process and documentation um, I think is a critical challenge that uh, that's going to be unique to individual teams and it's something that we should consider as we as we think about employing new ideas like I'll, like we're talking about here. Um, deployment automation. Uh, this one I think is fairly straightforward. Once you understand how you're going to version control that, I mean, can you build a pipeline um, that automatically generates your uh, deliverable quality document from uh, your controlled source. And, and I think hopefully you'll, you'll see that yes, indeed you can. You get into ideas like uh, test automation and continuous integration. What does that mean for a document? Well, I, I think it's an interesting question and I'll share another story on that. Um, it, it, in my world right now, uh, I have members of my team who are working to get some uh, formal test documentation updated and delivered uh, for a major release of our of our system. And uh, I have a very talented uh, analysts who who told me they are spending and will spend the next months cutting and pasting data from uh, from various environments, uh, test outcomes, etc, into these uh, Microsoft Office documents. And that's how they spend the entirety of their day, um, pulling, cutting, pasting data into Word documents and then sending it out for review. Um, you know, this is a is, is kind of the sort of task that we would describe as toil. It seems like it's ripe for automation. How can I pull information from the actual pipelines that build, test, and deploy uh, or deliver our systems into that documentation? Uh, such that we can streamline that process and allow those individuals to focus on creative work um, rather than this toil that they're dealing with now. Another consideration in test automation uh, is, is simple quality checks. Um, do we have, oftentimes deliverables have a did, for example. Have we followed the, the data item description properly? Do we have the right sections in place? Can we find the right headers? Do we have, you know, can we do quality checks like maybe simple spelling? Um, have we have we captured a dictionary that represents the language of our program uh, and our domain? And are we are we following that appropriately? Um, we can incorporate these kind of checks in an automated process that allows us to perform continuous integration using trunk-based development in our documentation. Um, I do think it's a great way to gather and implement customer feedback from a process perspective. Um, using your change management system to actually collect expectations and acceptance criteria for documentation changes as well as system changes, I think works well um, and allows you to incrementally evolve that system in small batches. And then we want to look again, we talked about the change approval process, look for ways to lighten the load there, look for ways to be more outcome oriented, more experimentation oriented, more demonstration oriented, um, even as it applies to our documents. Uh, how would you do that? Uh, I think there's a number of strategies that you could apply. Um, but don't let the documentation be the anchor that holds you back from implementing these uh, improvements uh, across your program. And you'll need strategies uh, to, to do that. So we hear a lot about the software factory. Um, I would suggest we need a document factory as well. Uh, that document factory probably needs to be a critical uh, part of our software factory. And as we were talking about in that, in that last story, uh, if we had the ability to pull data, objective evidence straight from our software factory, incorporate it into the published documentation that accompanies our product, I, I think we're going to get a lot of value, um, a lot of a lot of efficiency in terms of uh, of, of schedule, 
uh, as well as uh, at cost advantages and, and really drive our affordability. I think it also has the opportunity to increase uh, our engineers' enjoyment uh, of their time in the workplace. Um, I find that most people don't love sitting down hammering out documents. Um, some, some people are totally into that, I get it, but for the most part, we want our people focused on the uh, implementation of capability within the system and not let the documentation be a, a drag for them. So I spent some time over the holidays exploring potential solutions. And to me, they really uh, fell into two critical um, categories. The first category is you need some configuration manageable way to, to capture your document specification or perform typesetting. And the three key, uh, at least that I had discovered technologies uh, were Markdown. Um, this is very popular, especially in uh, on the web, uh, something that's often used in configuration management systems for README and, and, uh, and lightweight documentation for, for products and projects. Uh, so widely adopted. It's very simple, um, but it's also somewhat limited. Uh, those limitations in specific areas are often overcome by different flavors of Markdown, different extensions to the Markdown spec um, that are often free and openly available uh, for your use. So there's a, an interesting um, community around uh, Markdown and its evolution and its extension that's uh, that's worth looking into. Another interesting one was restructured text. So I found this to be uh, very, uh, very, very useful, first and foremost. Uh, but I also found it to be primarily centered in Python documentation. And uh, a lot of tools built around that to support the documentation of Python projects, uh, etc. But it is a general purpose capability, and I thought it had a lot of value to consider as we're looking at uh, potential solutions. And then anyone who's uh, completed their advanced degree and uh, you know written their dissertation, especially in the engineering or mathematics environment, it will be familiar with LaTeX or LaTeX. Um, this is incredibly powerful uh, typesetting language. Uh, designed and built a long time ago by uh, Donald Knudsen, but the, it's also incredibly complex. It's a text-based uh, typesetting language that allows you to do pretty much anything that you can imagine uh, within your document. Um, hugely powerful, but it has a learning curve that I worry a lot of our teams would struggle with. So uh, you have to make a decision, you know, where do you think your team needs to live on this spectrum of simple to complex, of limited to powerful? And, and I would argue perhaps there's some uh, combination of tools that could be brought to bear here to, uh, to help solve your specific uh, solution with your specific team. Now, the other category I have is tools and frameworks, and this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, a handful of things that I explored and thought were useful and interesting. Um, one is a, a framework called Jekyll. It's a Ruby based framework that is a static site generator. Um, if, you've, if you're familiar with uh, the website for our meetup, it is actually a Jekyll uh, auto generated website from uh, our configuration management repository for the meetup. Um, it's, it's, I would say it's fairly powerful um, and it's relatively simple. It's not, there is a learning curve, don't get me wrong, but it is relatively simple. If you, can, if you know HTML, uh, cascading style sheets, a little bit of Ruby and uh, watch a few tutorials on how it's structured and how uh, your sites are generated, you'll find that, it, uh, that you can build sites with it. Now, a website is not a document and uh, I would suggest you need to consider your use case uh, and, and, and how you might apply some of these tools. Now, Sphinx is, is something that really focuses on restructured text. It's used by a number of, uh, of websites. Uh, one, one popular website around restructured text is, uh, is called Read the Docs. Um, and 
from my research, it looks like they're using tools capability from that Python ecosystem, uh, such as Sphinx to, to, uh, to manage that infrastructure and publish that website. It's really cool. It's very powerful. It's a little bit complex. Um, if you're, if you're, you know, deep into Python, I think you would be very comfortable in this space. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's certainly worth something looking into. A relatively new tool, Hugo, um, is, is a static site generator that's uh, using the, I'll say, relatively new Golang. Uh, Golang's now over a decade old, um, but has been sharply increasing in popularity um, in the last few years. And Hugo is an incredibly high performance um, static site generator with a lot of templates, uh, a lot of uh, off-the-shelf solutions to help you. Uh, build sites. My testing and experimentation with it didn't go as deep as I've uh, done with Jekyll, but uh, it, it appears that uh, you can you can do some pretty powerful things with that in my experience. And then uh, you have tools like Pandoc. Pandoc is a phenomenal tool. Um, it's a it's a converter. So if you have a markdown file and you want to get a HTML out of it, you can use Pandoc. You can use other tools for that um, uh, specific scenario, but Pandoc is much broader. If you want to convert your, your markdown to Microsoft Word, it will let you do that. If you want to convert it to LaTeX, it will let you do that. It's incredibly powerful, um, almost a Rosetta Stone of document formats, and you can go to and from uh, a, a wide variety of documents. So that's a, a, a powerful and useful tool. Uh, for you to consider as you think about how you would um, manipulate and transform your, your documentation. Uh, another static site generator that I'm not as deep into is Gatsby. It's a uh, JavaScript based. If, if your team is, is very deep in JavaScript and understands React.js, um, this will probably be a natural environment for them. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at it. It does seem to be a very popular tool in the community, um, specifically for, for website generation. Um, I haven't explored it for document management and document generation. And then, of course, there are tons of services out there. Um, some, a, a lot of libraries, especially open source libraries uh, that, that have value. And, and I have seen them across multiple languages from Java, Python, uh, Ruby, et cetera, to do different uh, solutions. Now, some of those services, I do want to warn you, are content management systems. And what I discovered as I was researching this is those content management systems often violate our, some of our DevOps practices. So for example, uh, version control is critically important to what we're trying to accomplish here. I wanna know who changed what, when they changed it and why they changed it. And I want something that will directly support um, my, you know, a continuous integration pipeline for delivery of my documentation. These CMS tools that I've tested tend to be database driven. So they'll, um, they're, use, they're user friendly for sure, but they, uh, they store your changes in a backend database that doesn't have the kind of version controls that we're, we would really want to uh, implement within our teams, uh, especially for you know, rigorous engineering uh, product development delivery. So, you may find value in some content management systems, but I would encourage you to proceed with caution. Uh, make sure that you aren't inadvertently violating uh, certain practices that you that you value. So to end this, I, I think a, an experiment is uh, is worthwhile. So I want to experiment around rigorously configuration managed document with uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery. And as we've uh, we've learned in previous meetups, there whenever we're we're exploring a new space um, and we want to really focus on our learning, um, applying a, a you know scientific method uh, principles is a great way to go. So we establish a hypothesis, we and then we do the the the, the least amount of work necessary to uh, create a, a minimum viable product that either proves or disproves our hypothesis. And I hope that you uh, resonate with uh, my hypothesis. It's uh, in line with what we've been talking about. I believe that if I can establish a simple plain text solution for document content, I can employ rigorous configuration management, automate 
quality uh, checks and delivery. And I'll know I'm successful if I can create a useful, you know, by useful, I mean quality digital product, consumable and searchable via browser and complementary traditional document uh, that we could deliver as a seed rule for our contracts. So um, I think that there's one thing that I, that I, I probably explored a little further than was abs would be absolutely necessary is that uh, creating a, a searchable browser-based source of documentation. In some contexts, that may not have value, but I thought in general, uh, when, when we have teams working in a development environment and they need to understand uh, some aspect of, of documentation, the ability to quickly go in and search and find what they need um, you know, without having to drill through layers and layers and layers of SharePoint or shared folders would be a valuable thing. And then, of course, the, the procedural delivery is a very important aspect, as, our, as, as we talked about earlier. So I, I wanted to create a test, uh, test my hypothesis, and uh, I decided a simple way to do that would be to see if I could make a cookbook. So I have got uh, cabinets full of cookbooks uh, with dog-eared pages, with, uh, with loose leaf paper, um, you know, handwritten adjustments all over the place. And I wanted to see if I could bring all of that into a Git repository and automate a pipeline that publishes a, a website as well as a PDF. And uh, I hope you'll agree that I was successful in proving the hypothesis with this minimum viable product uh, that I call Git Food, uh, available at gitfood.org. So let's just take a quick look at Git Food. Git Food is a very uh, simple website. I, ch I went with Jekyll uh, because I'm familiar with it and it was, uh, it was fairly friendly for me to, uh, to develop that capability. Um, I was able to find templates that I thought worked well for me, um, all free and open source. Um, so, and, and I could build automation around this. Uh, so what is Git Food? As I said, it's just a collection of recipes, um, nothing particularly uh, special. Uh, although some of the special, some of the recipes are special. I'll, I'll certainly recommend the lobster bisque uh, to anyone who, who en enjoys seafood. But, um, for the purposes of our test, we need to go take a look at our GitHub. And here is, uh, I called my repository food. Um, here is our repository that contains uh, all of this content. And if I go and I take a look in docs, uh, you'll see a folder here called posts. And each one of these files is a markdown file that contains a specific recipe uh, that, that goes into the cookbook. So let's take a look at uh, uh, shrimp and grits, grits of yaya's, incredible recipe um, uh, from, from a, a, an amazing restaurant, uh, the Great Southern down on the Gulf Coast of Florida. But here you can see uh, we've captured some metadata that allows us to organize and categorize uh, the recipe. We have a short description uh, a listing of ingredients and instructions, and each of the recipes follows that. You can imagine this being a section uh, in your document uh, or even a subsection. And when we look at the raw text associated with that, you can see it's, it's fairly straightforward. Markdown just uses simple indicators in plain text like, um, like hash hash to indicate a second level heading. Uh, dashes indicate or bulleted lists. Uh, numbered lists are just a number dot and then the entry on the list. So it's a very, I think, low, um, low hurdle uh, in terms of learning curve. The, the metadata takes a little bit of time for people to get their heads around, but they're just tags like you would see on, you know, in your Facebook or, or other um, online uh, sources. So uh, hopefully you can see the simplicity in that. Let's go back out and take a look at our continuous integration. So whenever I make a change and commit to the, or, or a pull request uh, into the main, 
it kicks off this automated uh, build. I, I implemented this on GitHub with GitHub Actions. Um, I have built and tested this in other environments such as GitLab uh, with GitLab CI CD and it does work. But um, you define a series of steps and, and I used uh, a combination of uh, markdown and restructured text. And I do some very simple things like check for spelling errors. Uh, I'm, I just uh, built up a spell checker Python script that searches through all of our markdown files and, uh, and, and, and errors out if it finds any, any uh, misspelling. Um, I did a little bit of linting, uh, but then I created a script that would generate from a table of contents a restructured text file. Now the table of contents I use to, to organize things. How do I know what recipe goes where um, and what the sections are? And so we did that. And then I proved that I could uh, turn that restructured text into uh, what I'll call a, dis a deliverable document, uh, a PDF file. And if we go back to the beginning, uh, we can see that, that these, uh, these workflows run and they pass and they produce a release of the document. So let's take a look at our latest release. Um, we get the source code uh, if, if folks are interested in that release, but I also get a PDF of that document. And you can see it's got a, uh, hopefully you like the title page. It auto generates a table of contents. Uh, these are hyperlinked. Uh, so let's find our well, let's just scroll through. Um, it's organized by that table of contents. So we start with appetizers and we just work our way down through uh, each of those recipes organized um, page by page. I did uh, go ahead and create something that shows that auto generates uh, headers and footers. Uh, so this particular release was done on, on January 2nd. Um, I'm using uh, semantic versioning so that we can always trace it back to a tag in the repository and I auto generate page numbers. So I hope that you see um, that that is a reasonable way um, to generate fairly decent quality documentation. One other thing I'll, I will point out, uh, I did think about things like figures and graphics and in, in your documents and how you would configuration manage those. Um, I think there's more to look at here, but I experimented with scaled vector graphics and open source tools to edit those. The scaled vector graphics are really interesting because um, if I go into, see if I have an example I can show you. Um, oh, I do have one. It, the scaled vector, vector graphics actually allows me to do some work and showing uh, deltas visually. And I thought that was, was really neat. So let me see if I've got a pull request here closed. So I can do things like look at the file changes. Um, scale vector graphics is a text file. So you can see the detailed nuance of changes in your file. But I can also do a rich diff of, of scaled vector graphics in my, uh, in my CM. And you can see the differences in that particular image. Um, and then you have tools that, that let you, oops, see if I can, oh, I can't do it here. You have tools that let you, ooh, that's the, swipe it back and forth, looking for those objects or uh, what's called the onion skin fade one version to the other and highlight differences. I thought that was a pretty neat way to, to manage change to graphics um, as you went through it. And it's something that I used as I uh, reviewed uh, my own pull request going in, make sure I hadn't uh, done anything unintentional. So that concludes um, the demonstration. Um, I hope you found it useful and, and interesting. I hope there's some ideas that you might be able to adopt and tailor uh, to your environment. I, I will tell you, I've tried to do that in, uh, in my workplace and, and my context and um, availability of tools is a challenge. Um, and then uh, 
reliable infrastructure to employ those tools can also be a challenge. So don't overlook uh, the fact that you may have some hurdles uh, in your specific environment, uh, but I wish you the best of luck as you explore that space. And as always, uh, I wanna thank you. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, we leave you with a list of resources and uh, I look forward to our next uh, live meetup where we'll be focusing on a, a, a virtual lean coffee should be a good experiment and uh, I'll see you then. Thank you.